you have your uh, Bible with you, on, on your phone, or actual paper one. Uh, Matthew chapter 14 is where we turn now, and verse 22 down to uh, verse 33. The context is that uh, Jesus has fed what we call the feeding of the 5,000. It's one of those rare stories in the Gospels that's recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, and John. It's a bit of a misnomer because it says that Jesus you know, fed 5,000 men, but they were all the women and all the children as well, so we're talking about, I don't know, the feeding of 15,000 quite easily or more. Verse 22 of Matthew 14. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. <coughs> Heavenly Father, through this word, speak to us now. Speak into our lives and the situations in which we find ourselves, we pray. Amen. Do you recognize this scenario? It's a parent-child scenario. Do as you're told. Why should I? Well, because I say so. I've often counseled parents, don't say because I'm bigger than you, because the day may come when they're bigger than you, and then the tables might be reversed. There's sometimes an expectation of obedience. I would have been absolutely hopeless in the military. Because in the military, you're given an order and you're supposed to do it straight away. Me, I'd be asking, why? I would need to know the reason. Uh, so you can see why I wouldn't last long in the mil military where instant obedience to an order is expected. Matthew 14 and verse 22 could be translated like this. Immediately, Jesus insisted. There's authority in the word, not just told them. He insisted. It implies he had to say it more than once. <laughs> he insisted the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him. Now, Matthew doesn't actually tell us why Jesus was so insistent. But if we compare the accounts, and in this case, compare the account of the feeding of the 5,000 with John's account, um, we find perhaps there was a particular reason. Let me read to you um, John 6 and verses 14 to 15. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, the feeding of that vast crowd, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus, it seems, was alarmed by what was going on in the mindset of the crowd. He had to dampen down, at that point, early in his ministry, their expectations. They are probably expectations that his disciples would have shared. 
He wants to get away and just get his head around it to connect with his heavenly father in prayer. And he didn't want his disciples to be part of that crowd with their agenda of taking him and making king by force. So perhaps that's the reason. I'm speculating slightly, but I think it's reasonable that Jesus had to insist. Now you lot go, get in the boat and cross the lake. That's the force of the insistence in the word that's used there in Matthew's gospel. And stop arguing me, just do as you're told. <laughs> I can imagine Peter, Simon Peter, protesting to Jesus about this particular order. I sense that there was a reluctance. Now look, there's a general point of principle for us as followers of Jesus here in our understanding of what discipleship is all about. God hasn't got to explain himself to us when he tells us to do something. Right? God is not bound to explain himself to you and to me. He isn't obliged to tell us anything. I, mean, I don't know about you, but not everyone can cope with that. I've met plenty of people for whom discipleship includes God having to justify himself to our satisfaction. A bit like me, you know, stopping and asking my commanding officer, why? Explain yourself to me. And you can imagine the colour rise in the commanding officer's face, you know, as, as I am told, given the short shrift, anyway. In the Old Testament, if you know the Old Testament story of Job, he never got an explanation. We know what was going on behind the scenes more than he did. But God, in all Job's questions to him, and you think, well, he deserved some sort of explanation. Well, he never got it. God is not obliged to explain himself to us. And the disciples, including Simon Peter, needed to learn that. Jesus insisted, get in the boat and go. And so they had to. The important thing is that whether reluctantly or not, they did as they were told. Have you ever obeyed God reluctantly? That's the important bit, the obeying bit. Yeah, okay, so sometimes it might be reluctantly rather than enthusiastically, but, and I said that some of you nodded, yes. It can be a reluctance sometimes, but if we know God has spoken, we just do as we are told. And having done what they were told, they started rowing. And they were immediately, it seems, hit by a storm with the winds against them. Now this was not good. Here we have a, a group of experienced fishermen. Uh, they probably weren't too concerned at first. They've had plenty of strong breezes to contend with on the Sea of Galilee before. But after a while, something told these experienced fishermen that this was one of those storms that's, you know, one in a hundred years, as you might say today, the sort of storm that made them wish that they were tucked up in bed at home. They were in trouble on the lake and they knew it. Now, the last time that something like this had happened, you can read about it in Matthew chapter 8, which is a separate account of a storm on a lake. In that story, Jesus is with them in the boat. He's in the stern of the boat, fast asleep, but at least he's with them in the boat. But not this time. Jesus has insisted that they go on without him. And he's gone up on a mountainside to find somewhere where he can be alone to pray. Now, thinking about these two occasions, what might Simon Peter have learnt from them? Years later, as an apostle, as an under-shepherd of the flock, I wonder how he might have used these stories, these events, as illustrations in his preaching and in his teaching. Can you imagine saying, now, I remember when we were in the boat with Jesus and he was fast asleep, would you believe? I remember when we were told by Jesus to get in the boat and he must have known a storm was coming and this time he wasn't even with us. What points? might he have made? 
I'll leave that thought hanging with you for a moment. But note this, on both occasions, they were caught up in a storm which was not as a result of disobedience to Jesus. They were there in these storms because they'd been obedient to Jesus. Never tell anyone that becoming a Christian means that life is all plain sailing. <laughs> because it's not. Three reasons for storms, and I'm here looking at the wider scriptures. First of all, some storms that we run into may be because there has been disobedience on our part. Who, did, who popped up in our quiz? Guess who earlier? Jonah. And there he was in that famous storm, and if he'd been disobedient, he wouldn't have been. If he'd been obedient, he wouldn't have been in that storm. And Psalm 107 tells the story in poetic form of people who, having disobeyed God and gone against his word, found themselves in storms. So sometimes, storms can be the result of not doing as we are told by God. And when you ask the question, well, what have I done to deserve this, is actually a fair question. <laughs> Psalm 32 is a psalm in which David acknowledges that what he has done was out of order and God's hand was heavy upon him. Secondly, um, not always. You see, the reason for it now might be for God's glory. Jesus' disciples asked Jesus in John 9, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Stuff and nonsense, says Jesus. Well, that's from my interpretation. Neither this man sinned nor his parents, said Jesus, but this happens so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Now, there's a thought. The difficult storm, the tragic circumstances might be there because God is going to be glorified through them. Let me take you to Philippians chapter 1. This is 20 to 21. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, this is the Apostle Paul, but will have sufficient courage that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, what, notice what Paul is saying there. I, he says, want God to be glorified in and through my body. Whether it's a living body, or a dead body, it's beside the point, he seems to be saying. I want God to be glorified in my body, whether I live or whether I die. Reflecting on this verse many years ago, it's meant that in part of my sort of regular every so often prayers, I pray the prayer, Lord, I pray that you will be glorified in and through my dying and my death. Have you ever thought of praying that? Not instinctive, is it? But why not? Lord, when I go, may your name be glorified. Paul says, I want to glorify Christ, and whether that's in a living body or a dead body, I don't care, as long as Christ is glorified. Wow, now there's somebody who's gone a long way in this journey of discipleship and has a deep understanding of what it means. Thirdly, Talking about reasons for storms, Scripture makes it clear that we live in a hostile world. And we shouldn't be surprised, perhaps, when storms crash in on us. The Apostle Peter, interestingly, years later after this account in Matthew 14, says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. This is when persecution was being ramped up um, later in the first century. Why are you surprised that this is happening? Didn't Jesus say, look, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you as well? I was born into a country where persecution of Christians just doesn't happen. We live, or I have lived, therefore, in exceptional times, not in New Testament times. The norm in the New Testament is persecution of some sort or another. 
because we've had life relatively easy as Christians in this country, country for so long, we therefore are surprised when the world is hostile against us and it is becoming increasingly hostile. For those of you who prayed a prayer, oh Lord, for a return to New Testament times, will you get any answer to your prayer? At the season after Advent, we often make much of the name Emmanuel, God with us. It's actually a theme that Matthew in his gospel makes much of. At the beginning and the end of his gospel, there's this sense of God with us. The name Emmanuel, which means God with us in the nativity story. And how does the gospel end? And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Two great brackets. God with us. Beginning the end of Matthew's gospel. And it crops up in between. So, in this story, in what sense is Jesus living up to his billing as Emmanuel? Well, as I said, in chapter 8, he was with them, even though he was fast asleep. But here, in chapter 14, he's not even there. Now, the point that Matthew, I think, seems to be making, and the point that Peter would have learned well, no doubt, was this. It doesn't always feel that God is with us. At least not in the ways that we would expect. Many of you will know the, uh, you know, the, sort of the, the story of the footprints in the sand. Of when somebody who said, Lord, where were you? Why only one set of footprints? Where's mine gone when I needed you most? Oh, my child, it was then I was carrying you. Jesus was up this mountain and he was praying. But I suspect he was praying with his eye on them. Because from the mountain, he could see the lake. He could probably, if the moon was bright, make out the boat. He could see that they were in trouble. I would find it extraordinary if I discover when I'm in glory that Jesus didn't also then pray for them. There's a thought. We thought about it this morning, that Jesus may have prayed for you by name before the throne of grace in glory. I just thought that and I'm going all goosebumps all over. But he is our great high priest who names us before God in his heart. Let's move on in the story. We know that you know, Jesus then comes to them and he walks on the lake. So he intervenes when they were exhausted. Matthew gives us a time frame. And we're talking here about, about seven or eight hours of rowing against the wind. They were strong men, but even so. They must have been absolutely shattered. They were reaching the point where they had nothing left to give. You've been in that position. Oh, you so want God to do something. You so want God to step in. But sometimes he waits until we're at the end of ourselves. Why? So that when the answer comes, only he gets the glory. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, writes Paul, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond, he says, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So I wonder if Peter, in his sermons a year later, says, he did come to us, but we were shattered. We, this is about had it. So that when he came, and we saw what he did, boy, did we worship. We could take no credit for being rescued at all.
Jesus said this to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The context there is of Paul pleading with the Lord to take away this thorn in his flesh, which was debilitating his ministry. Lord, if I didn't have this thorn in my flesh, I could do so much more for you. And we're told he pleaded with the Lord three times, take this from me. And each time God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Therefore, says Paul, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. When was the last time you rejoiced in your weaknesses? When you boasted of your weaknesses? I'm thinking you have to think hard, aren't you? We usually moan about our weaknesses. We normally grumble about our weaknesses. Yes? Am I right or am I wrong? No. Paul had somehow learned that acknowledging his weaknesses, the things that he would not have volunteered for, the things that he found debilitated, actually could be a channel and a means of God's glory. So, if you want to follow Paul's example, you've really got to get it inside of you that what matters more than anything else in the universe is the glory of God, and not your comfort, not your Happiness, which depends upon circumstances. Happiness is linked to what happens. And sometimes what happens, well, it doesn't make you happy. And that's the difference between happiness and joyfulness. Because even when things happen to make you miserable, the miracle of Christians is that they still rejoice in the Lord. Are you exhausted by life's storms? I don't know the details of what all of us here are going through. But sometimes we do find ourselves, as we would say, at the end of our tether. Take this home with you. Know this. God has not abandoned you. He will, when he judges the time is right, come to you. But it might take you by surprise as it did in this story. Because they saw Jesus walk into them on the lake. Now they may have been praying, Lord, send Jesus to us, but they hadn't expected that. You see, without the storm, they wouldn't have had their eyes opened even wider as to who Jesus is. We're not told, actually, that they did pray a, a prayer, wishing that Jesus was there. And I'm going to hold my hand up again. I am so glad of those times when God has answered the prayers I haven't prayed. <laughs> and then in the story we have what I call a classic Simon Peter moment. First, a Peter moment. They're afraid. They're thinking they're seeing a deceitful, ghostly apparition of some sort. And Jesus assures them that it was indeed himself. Then, emboldened by the sight and the presence of Jesus walking on the water, he has a surge of faith. Woo! And asks Jesus if he could do the same. Jesus gave him the nod, and Peter got out of the boat. And started moving toward Jesus. That's the Peter moment. Well done, Peter. What great faith. Then, of course, comes the Simon moment. It all threatens to go badly wrong. He looks around him at the storm. And the storm swamped his faith. Looking to Jesus, his faith could have swamped the storm. But listen... I'm not knocking Jesus. Uh, I'm certainly not knocking Jesus. I'm not knocking Peter here. Because if it was me, I wouldn't even have got out of the boat. I'd have been happy with the fellowship of James and John and Andrew in the boat. Nice, safe and secure. So I'm not knocking Peter for suddenly looking at the storm and thinking, oh, heck. got out of the boat, saw the storm, and his faith failed him. 
Life of faith can be a bit like that, can't it? You have a moment when you're feeling strong and confident. Yes, Lord, amen. And then the next day, oh, and you've fallen off your bike. Let's stay with that. Learning to ride a bike. Do you know what? I could give you a wonderful lecture. How to balance and ride a bike. And I'll tell you how to do it. So, emboldened by my expert tuition, you get on a bike and you start to pedal off. What happens? You fall off. You graze your knee. You come back to me and say, thanks a lot, but it doesn't work. So I say, oh, well, you need to listen to lecture number two. And in lecture number two, I say the same thing as in lecture number one. So you go off, get on your bike, and you fall off the other side this time. So now you've got two badly grazed knees. And you'll come back to me and say, well, thanks a lot. Do you know what? I find that such a powerful illustration of the spiritual life. Pastor, that told us to pray, but it didn't work. Well, go back and pray it again. Because just like learning to ride a bike, suddenly, for some unknown reason, you get your balance. And you find that what I said in my lecture, how to ride a bike, does work. And I've not said anything different. And sometimes getting our spiritual balance is a bit like that. We look at other Christians and think, well, how do they do that? And we try the same and it all goes belly up. And the temptation then is to give up. No, sometimes it's that perseverance. Yes, Peter may well have sunk in the storm, but I think his illustration years later, in these storms of life, when the Roman Empire was getting a bit hot underneath him, he'd learnt that no matter what happens in the storm, if you do keep your eyes on Jesus, you won't sink. And so Peter's eyes, along with the rest of his disciples, are gradually being opened. We're still in the early part of Jesus' ministry here in this story. They're being opened to see who Jesus truly is. His, their eyes are being opened to see more and more of his splendor, more and more of his glory. And what they witnessed that day, having been told insistently by Jesus, get in that boat. They hit a storm. Jesus is nowhere to be seen. The end result is that, what? They worshipped him. They worshipped him. And they declared that Jesus truly, unmistakably, was the Son of God. Can you imagine the goosebumps in all those disciples? in that story. Wow! And it wouldn't have happened if they hadn't got into the boat and hit a storm. Towards the end of Jesus' ministry, some Gentiles, some Greeks, uh, pitched up and asked uh, Philip this. Sirs, they said, we would like to see Jesus. We would like to see Jesus. Can you echo that in your heart this morning? Lord, I'd like to see Jesus. I'd like to see more of him. I'd like to understand him better. I'd like to love him more, serve him more faithfully. What if he sends a storm? Are you up for it then? What if you are now in a storm. Is it conceivable it's one that Jesus insisted you get into that boat and go out into? Will it result in your worship being enriched, your faith strengthened, God glorified in one sense? Well, that's your choice. The old thing is, you know, these things can either make us better or bitter. You choose. 
and just how much I think Peter's understanding of his Lord was to grow in the years that followed is what's seen when he wrote this in his letter. Praise be, he says, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you moan and groan, no, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Oh yes, by the time you wrote that, Peter had come a long way in his understanding of who Jesus was. But this story in Matthew 14 was one of those pivotal moments when he, along with the other disciples, first said, truly, you are the Son of God. Allow me one final word. If you do find your faith failing in a storm and you're beginning to sink, will you follow Peter's example and cry out, help? He will. He will. Let's pray.